all about machine learning. So Mike graduated, oh, how long ago now, Mike? Like six months ago? Uh, see, I defended in April. I think I graduated in May. Okay, so it's yeah. only been a couple months. Couple months. Again, seems like it's been like a million years these last <laughs> few months. Um, so he's graduated recently, so also another great person if you have He's given this lecture on machine learning. This is what, your fourth year giving this lecture? I think it might be more than that. Five? Yeah, I think it's been a long time. It might be five, yeah. I think it is five. Uh, so it's a really good lecture. He um, is fine with you interjecting if you have questions. The other thing we're going to try is the raise hand feature. So you can still chat and ask questions if you want. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry that I didn't do this earlier in the summer. But if you have a question and you would like to interject but feel uncomfortable unmuting, if you raise your hand, we will monitor the kind of the participant box as well and then can call on you so that you can ask your question too. So we'll try that in addition as well. But without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike. Please uh, listen, ask questions, learn from Mike. Thanks, Mike. All right, great. Thanks for the introduction, Dave. Um, as, as he mentioned, uh, please, please feel free to just you know speak up if something is unclear. Um, th this is, uh, as he mentioned, I have given this lecture a couple of times, but it, I do change it every year and so um, if some parts of it are, are unclear, it may, may be a new section. So I uh, appreciate any feedback as well. All right, um, we'll, we'll start with, oh, uh, let's see, let's get my mouse working. Okay, there we go. All right, so here are uh, today's objectives. Um, after this lecture, you should be able to define and explain uh, general concepts of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, you will have gained some familiarity with various applications of machine learning, and you will have seen an overview of how machine learning models are trained. And um, lastly, you will understand uh, a loose categorization of different types of machine learning problems. So uh, I'd like to start out this lecture by orienting where, where we are, uh, just in terms of what we're going to talk about. So. If we start with all knowledge that exists in the universe, you can split that into things that humans know and things that humans don't know. And if we expand the things that humans know, you can categorize that into things that are science and that are not science. And then within science, you have lots of different types of sciences. And uh, what we're gonna be talking about today is right here. So artificial intelligence is a information science. And so, I'd like to start with a really like accessible, uh, simple definition of artificial intelligence. So that's simply um, a program that does something smart. And now something smart can be almost anything. Um, a program that helps you find your way to a place that you've never been before is an artificial intelligence. A uh, program that determines the chance of rain tomorrow is an artificial intelligence. Uh, a program that helps a doctor determine what treatment to give a patient is an AI um, and a a uh, website that tries to sell you stuff like this, uh, you know, maybe after you bought something like that, um, is is an AI. Uh, this this actually happened to me, um, even though I don't actually I don't actually own a dog, so so in this case it didn't quite work. But um, we're, Am Amazon's trying real hard. So those are all examples of applied intelligences. Um, that is, it's an intelligence that operates. Um, within the boundaries of some specific problem. Um, it's designed and trained for that particular application and it cannot be used to solve a different problem without significant modification. So uh, for example, if you take your self-driving car and uh, you, know, you ask, you, you give it some information about a cancer patient, you ask it, what drugs should I give this patient? It's not gonna be able to answer that for you. Uh, these applied intelligences are uh, in contrast uh, to what we call a general artificial intelligence, which uh, can learn and solve problems uh, regardless of field um, without restraints that have been defined uh, beforehand by humans. And so uh, people, researchers, um, companies have developed many, many applied artificial intelligences for a wide variety of applications and use cases. Um, however, a general AI does not currently yet exist. Um, in terms of looking at what might be required for general artificial intelligence, a baseline requirement uh, would be that a generally intelligent computer should probably be able to perform at the level of a human in all cognitive tasks. And so you have probably heard of the Turing test. This is where an investigator, which is depicted here as 
character C, asks a series of questions. They administer the test to entities A and B, uh, in which in this case, A is a computer and B is a human, but the investigator does not know that. And then based on the responses to, these, to, to this test, the investigator is trying to determine which one is the computer and which one is the human. And so the computer passes this test if it can fool the investigator. Now, uh, when people think about you know, really advanced general AI, you would expect maybe the computer to perform at a level higher than a human, um, but we're, we're, we're not quite there yet. Um, we, we probably want to match humans first before we can see, and before we'll see that kind of uh, a leap in performance. So in order to accomplish this task, the AI needs four components. First, uh, natural language processing enables communication. So it, this doesn't really matter like what language, it could be English or Spanish or German. Uh, a natural language is one that has developed through use and repetition rather than conscious planning uh, and prescription. So th these are languages that humans use to communicate with one another, languages that we learn growing up. Um, they're, they're not a you know, formalized uh, computer language that is, is, is you know, all rooted in, in you know, uh, very rigid syntax rules. Uh, languages, most importantly, um, can evolve over time, uh, whereas uh, that process for computer languages is, is typically uh, much more difficult. So some examples of this uh, would be you know, these sentences that we communicate in, lions or cats, uh, cats or animals. And in, in terms of getting a computer to understand these sentences, seems like it should be relatively simple, but, uh, let's see, one sec. Uh, sentences can, you know, rapidly get very complicated as we try to uh, express, you know, more more complex ideas and concepts and relationships. The next step, once this information has been processed by the AI, is uh, they need to to, to store it in uh, in some organizational form. Um, knowledge representation consists of things such as standard terminol uh, terminologies uh, and ontologies. These are organizational frameworks for concepts and ideas. Third, automated reasoning uses the stored information to answer questions and draw conclusions. Uh, here you have some sort of inference engine and the goal is to generate new knowledge from explicit knowledge. So up until this point, the knowledge that the AI has is explicit. These are things that it has read in documents or that has been told in conversation. Uh, generating new information through you know, deductive or inductive reasoning is the third requirement. Now, before we get to the fourth component, here's what the first three components put together might look like. Uh, this diagram represents what's typically called an expert system because it's usually built using knowledge from an expert. Um, it can also be called a knowledge-based system, or you might hear it called an expert agent. These are all basically the same thing. So how this works is that knowledge from an expert is uh, transferred into the system via some sort of user interface. Um, and that knowledge is encoded in the knowledge base. Once the knowledge base is built, an inference engine is implemented to reason over this data, which then allows a user to come in and ask questions and, and then receive answers. And sometimes the answers generated by the inference engine are also used to grow the knowledge base. So uh, following our example here, uh, you may have a knowledge expert come in and, and build the lines are cats and cats are animals information into the knowledge base. And then a user can come in and ask the, the inference engine, are lions animals? And the inference engine should return yes. Now these systems are relatively straightforward to build and use. They don't typically require a lot of computational power or resources. Um, all you really have to do is get an expert who's willing to share their knowledge with you. Uh, the weakness in a system like this is that the, this component, the inference engine, is static. You can put more knowledge into the system via the knowledge base, but you can't change how it thinks. And so that's where the fourth component comes in. Machine learning is the ability to recognize patterns and adapt to new information. Can the machine make changes to both its knowledge base and the inference engine? So for example, given all of this additional information, 
Leopards are cats, cheetahs are cats, lions are furry, leopards are furry, cheetahs are furry. What would a human, given all of this, be able to conclude? Any ideas? We have a question, Mike. Okay, sure. Yeah, uh, I'll take the question. Well, sorry, I, I'm a second about... behind here. Yeah, and no problem. I, I don't see any hands. And Julian is asking, what kind of commands does the inference engine run? What does reasoning mean when dealing with AI? Okay, sure. So, in a expert based, like in a in a knowledge based system, um, which are relatively rudimentary uh, uh, artificial intelligences. Usually the reasoning is purely inductive or deductive. Um, and so uh, it's, it's, it's basically, um, it, it's effectively this first step here. Um, you have some relationship between concepts and it's able to link those together. Um, in terms of the second part of the question, I think we'll get to that later. Uh, Julian, if, if you still have a question at the end, ask it again. Um, but I, but, I, but I think we're, we're gonna talk a little bit more about what, what does it really mean for an AI to think or to learn. Great, that was, that was a good question, um, thanks. All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and, and give away the answer I, I here. I think, Mike, I think oh, there's sorry. one other either question or answer from Amanda. Sure, go to Amanda. okay. Uh, um, yeah, I was gonna say like the conclusion is that cats are furry, cause like, yeah. Okay, that's great. Uh, you were going to offer a reason, maybe. Can I, can I, can I push you on that? Well, um, like, it's sort of like, I don't know, the, the transitive property. Like, if, like, lions are, um, or, sorry, if leopards are cats and leopards are also furry, um, then cats are furry. Sure, right. So it notices that the, the, the theoretically, so as a human, right, we, we, can, we can sort of see all this information and we can sort of intuitively feel, okay, there's uh, lions, leopards, cheetahs, three types of animals here um, that, are all, that, are, that, that are all cats and they're all furry. And so then we can sort of infer that, well, given these three examples, cats are probably furry. This is, this is something that we can say, you know, with, with a decent amount of confidence. That is uh, the, the ability to see that pattern um, is a learned behavior. Uh, the, the, the babies are, are, are much worse at this than, than adults. Um, thing is that computers are, they're essentially mechanical babies. Uh, they, they don't know anything that they haven't been told. And so um, you, you the, 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 the challenge in machine learning is how, how do we get the machine to be able to, to recognize patterns without being told that there's a pattern here. So uh, this is you know, relatively easy for humans. Uh, in, in fact, humans are actually very good at this. Sometimes we see patterns where they don't exist. Um, but uh, when you get a computer to do this, that is machine learning. And so we can take this a step further, right? Input is not limited to text. You can, you can, use, you can use pictures. Um, and you know, we, could, we could show an AI a bunch of pictures and we could tell it like, hey, this is, this is a cat, even though it's not furry. And we could lie to it and say that this is also a cat. Um, and as it sees more and more examples, the AI uh, will you know, theoretically improve its understanding of the universe. So based on uh, these four components being part of a general artificial intelligence, we can see that machine learning is artificial intelligence, but not all artificial intelligence is machine learning. As you can imagine, machine learning techniques can be applied to help achieve the first three rules, uh, uh, the first three goals, but it's not, so it's not really a strict partitioning of, of tasks, uh, but these objectives are useful for organization and understanding. All right, so, now we understand that the end goal of artificial intelligence is to build intelligent machines and that machine learning is an extension of artificial intelligence. And so as we saw earlier, building an expert system to do simple reasoning 
is achievable, right? That feels like something that we can do, but it gets harder and harder as the problem you're trying to solve gets more complicated. So for example, if you're trying to tell the difference between a cat and an alligator, you might have just one rule. Um, for example, uh, you could, uh, I don't know, you could, you could see if the animal lays eggs. And if it lays eggs, then it's an alligator. Uh, and if it doesn't, it's a cat, right? Because as, as far as this system knows, alligators and cats are the only animals in existence. But what about snakes? You know, they lay eggs, right? And now you might say that, well, that's not fair because it wasn't part of the original problem. And you're right. The new problem is more complex. Uh, so the solution then has to be more complex as well. And so maybe snakes don't have feet. And so that's how you tell them apart from alligators. Now imagine expanding the system to hundreds or thousands of different animals. And oh, by the way, let's also include plants uh, and, and inanimate objects. And, and, and we can keep going, you know, we can, we can you know, throw in concepts and ideas that, that aren't tangible. Um, and the problem, you know, all of a sudden has become very, very difficult. So while it's easy to program a computer procedurally to do simple tasks, if you try to generate something resembling a complex intelligence, uh, you'll find that hardwiring it is incredibly difficult, um, really time consuming, and it gets harder as the complexity of the problem increases. So in order to solve this problem, we've decided to create a mechanism for learning. If a machine can learn to solve a problem by itself, then you don't have to tell it everything that it needs to know. And uh, instead of writing a lot of really painful software, um, you, you can mostly let hardware do the heavy lifting. Um, oh, this slide is not still supposed to be in here. Um, that's OK. Uh, right. OK. So. Machine learning is well suited for a variety of practical applications. Uh, the first that most people think of is probably big data. Uh, there's a lot of data that's being generated all the time. And right now, the internet is estimated to be something like 40 zettabytes. Um, I don't actually know how big a zettabyte is, but I know that when I gave this lecture two years ago, the internet was only 15 zettabytes. So uh, it's, it's growing exponentially. Uh, there's a lot of information in there, and most of it, a lot of it's generated by what's called the Internet of Things. So these are household appliances that talk to each other and track your actions and behavior. Um, it also includes a fair amount of biological data, like genome sequences, uh, gene expression arrays. There's data in your medical record. And these are just some examples, but there's knowledge hidden in all these databases out there. But the problem is that it's so large, there is no way that a human is going to go through and actually be able to find anything. The insights that exist within this ocean of data uh, are, are, are virtually impossible to pick out by hand. So machine learning is a great way to do this. Machine learning can also be used to build recommender systems. Uh, Pandora is probably best known for this. Their implementation of personalized radio, where you could tell it, you know, what songs you liked and what songs you didn't like, and it would play, you know, songs similar to what you liked, uh, was probably one of the earliest widespread consumer applications of this kind of technology. Um, like I want to say, Pandora Internet Radio first came out in what, like the like the early two thousands. Um, Netflix also does this, uh, you know rather poorly in some cases, you know, you watch one scary movie and all of a sudden it's like, all, all we've got is scary movies. Here are all my scary movies. Um, and so these systems attempt to make recommendations based on user behavior. Uh, the goal here is to generate a model of a user's tastes or preferences. And the advantage of using machine learning for this is that with one framework or one to the general shape of one model, you can just fill the model in with different numbers. And this allows you to generate a different model that recommends different things for a million different users, but it's all based on one architecture. You don't have to go out and specify, you know, the, the, the intricate details of everything by hand for every person. Another use for machine learning, um, as we hinted at earlier, is simply for complex problems. Um, the inverted pendulum is a pretty classic example of this. Uh, so here the goal is to balance the weight uh, in the circle 
above a uh, point of control. And so you can see that the goal state is inherently unstable because as soon as uh, the ball starts to tilt in one, dire one direction or the other, gravity will tend to accelerate it in that direction. And so you, you, in order to keep it balanced, you have to constantly be making adjustments here at the control point. The math behind how much force uh, acceleration you want to apply to the control point is relatively complicated. Uh, and it's difficult to do that in real time. So people tend to just use uh, machine learning. There's a machine learning solution for this. Um, and those solutions are actually implemented in self-stabilization protocols for uh, remote controlled drones. So now we've looked at the origins, uh, the purpose, and some applications of machine learning. And so we might have a more intuitive feeling for what machine learning is. Here is a formal definition. Machine learning is the study and improvement of the ability of computers to learn without explicit programming. Um, unfortunately, to actually make use of this definition, we have to define learning, which is a little bit more complicated. But in the context of a specific problem, uh, it might become a little bit more concrete. So. If we go back and use the previous example, if you present a human with this picture and you ask that person what kind of animal this is, uh, the picture represents a visual stimulus. It's an input of information. And that information is then processed by their mind, their brain. And when the person is done thinking, uh, you know, he or she says, this is a cat, that is an output. Now, the output isn't always correct, right? Somebody who hasn't seen this animal before might not know that it's a cat. Um, uh, they might be wrong, but you can correct them and tell them it's a cat. And the next time they see an animal similar to this, they will know that it's a cat and they will be able to properly tell you that. With machines, it's the same thing. Uh, you just replace the brain in the middle with some math. Uh, imagine that you could encode the picture of the cat uh, as a number or a set of numbers. And you pass that number to an equation and you evaluate that equation. And if the equation happens to be true, then the math says you have a cat. And if the equation is false, then you don't have a cat, you have something else. So just like with a human, the process of learning is making changes to this equation, improving it with examples so that it gets better and better at identifying cats. So maybe a little bit more formally, now that we have that example, learning is an improvement in some in performance on a task achieved through increased experience. And uh, if we wanna make that really scientific, we just replace some of the concepts with letters. Uh, so with additional experience E, performance P on some task T increases. And so this means exactly the same thing as the previous line in, in English, um, but it gives us the three things that we need to concentrate on. And those are experience, performance and task. So for example, uh, just, to, just to drive this home, uh, you could write a program that plays chess. And as we mentioned earlier, if you wanted to build an expert-based or knowledge-based system, uh, you could do this by you know, just telling the computer what some good moves are. And you, you, you could you know, plan out thousands and thousands or millions of moves. Uh, that is not machine learning, but it is artificial intelligence. Um, the first problem is that it's not machine learning. The second is that that program will take forever to write, and it's probably not actually even going to be that good. The, so in order to solve these two issues, uh, you can try to teach a machine to learn how to play chess. And so in this task, playing chess is the task. You imagine you wrote a program that played chess and you had it play thousands of games against itself. And that could be the experience. And while doing this, it learns which positions, board positions might be good or bad, might lead to wins or losses. And that could be your performance measure. So let's consider some tasks uh, in, in a little bit more detail. There is uh, classification where the goal is to take an input uh, and identify it or place it into categories. And so we've already seen an example of this where we are trying to distinguish cats from not cats. Uh, yes, Julian. Um, how do the three laws of robotics, if they do, how do they play into machine learning? 
because it's not explicitly coding, like you can't tell what to do. So how, how do you like enforce those three laws um, without being able to code it explicitly? Okay, just to clarify, the three laws of robotics were uh, you're talking about Asimov's laws of robotics? Yeah, yes. Okay. Um, no system that I have ever worked on has explicitly encoded those laws. So there, like, there are definitely models that I've built that could probably hurt me if they wanted to. Um, that's an interesting question that I actually don't feel prepared to answer right now. Um, I think when we get closer to a general AI, these are, that's an issue that we're going to run up against. Um, as of right now, this, most systems are too rudimentary to actually break those laws, um, unless the creator told them to, in which case they're just doing what they're told. Um, I'm, I'm not sure this is a this is a satisfact like this is a satisfying answer. Uh, we we can we can talk more about this later if that's okay. He's shaking his head yes. Uh, also, Sam, Sam mentioned don't forget the zeroth law, but that might also fall into that same category of discussion. what is the zeroth law? Sorry, refresh my memory. It's Sam, like, um, no robot can do anything that would. Um, result in the destruction of humanity as a whole or something. That, that, that's pretty important. So it's like the robot can't, in order to protect the, its owner, it can't like destroy everything else. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think there's a, there's a pretty common trope. Uh, we're getting a little off topic, but that's okay. Um, in uh, science fiction where, you know, somebody builds a AI and it's like pretty advanced and um, it's, it's like really good at doing the one thing it's supposed to do. I think the, the most recent version of it I've read, it's like, a, it's like a, it's like an, it's like a machine. that's like, it's job is to like make signs or something. Um, like it's, it's like advertising for a specific company or whatever. And it gets like really good at making signs. And for whatever reason, there's like no fail safe in the system. And it just keeps making signs until like, all of the raw materials on their planet has been converted into signs. There's no food anymore. Everyone dies. And the AI just like keeps making signs until like forever. Um, so that is definitely a thing that theoretically is possible if you, we were to design like a, like a really advanced AI and not put in safeguards. Um, so like theoretically it could happen. Um, I would imagine that the earliest safeguards are literally just rules in the system that say, hey, don't do this. Uh, but that would require um, people to foresee every potential thing that could go wrong, which of course we're gonna miss a few. Uh, you could build a subcomponent of the AI that sort of tries to predict the future um, and then seeks to avoid specific uh, like negative externalities that could happen. The only issue with this is that, um, especially with a lot of our, our currently most advanced AI models, uh, we don't really know exactly what they're thinking. Uh, we, we call these black box models. Um, you may have heard of uh, you know, neural networks being uh, you know, used to power self-driving cars. Um, the, the technology, the capability of the technology has advanced faster than our ability to sort of analyze what's going on on the inside. We have a lot of models that perform very well, but we can't really tell you why. This leads to a risk where, a very real risk, where um, we think the model is working correctly, uh, but it's really you know, doing something completely different under the hood. And while that may be fine in 99.9% you know, .9 of cases, there could potentially be an edge case where uh, you know, the system fails catastrophically. Um, there is some interesting research being done in, in these areas. I think um, there's um, uh, so, someone identified uh, if you want to use a camera to like read like a speed like a like a speed limit sign. Um, while you know image recognition for numbers is really good these days, turns out you can take an image and you can like tweak a couple of pixels in it, and it'll make the computer think that you know a 35. It'll make it think it says 85, uh, which that's real scary. 
Um, I try not to read that paper more than once every two years. Um, so, but um, there are people working on it. So that's, that's a good thing. I don't know that we can promise more uh, right now, but um, I, I think like there, there are some definitely like real ethical issues um, not, you know, aside from not just safety, but other things um, that are, you know, attached to uh, this type of technology. Um, and, and it is good that, that people are thinking about it and that, you know, we, we are working on uh, maybe hopefully having solutions. So, um, yeah. Does anyone, does anyone have any further questions on this point? Okay, great. Um, I will, we will keep moving then. Uh, let's see, where were we? Um, okay, I think we just started with classification tasks. So um, we've already seen an example, uh, which was distinguishing cats from, from not cats. Um, the next task I have listed here is regression. And so that's a very similar task to classification, except the output, uh, instead of being discrete categories, is a continuous number. Producing structured output from unstructured data uh, is the third task that we have listed. And an example of this would be the natural language processing that we discussed earlier. Anomaly detection is when you have a data set and you want to find specific samples of data that are weird. Uh, you know, these are data set points that somehow look different from the rest of the data. A uh, common example used for this is if you have uh, the, the logs of, you know, building access codes or building access to a secure building. And uh, you want to see if, you know, there are any, you know, anything out of the ordinary in terms of people entering the building when they usually don't, entering from a different entrance. Um, you know, you could flag these uh, as potential security threats and you would use an anomaly detection system for that. Uh, imputation is when you have a data set and some of the values are missing. Uh, either those data points you decided were of low quality, you tossed them out, or they were just simply never collected in the first place. Uh, you can use machine learning to make educated guesses to fill in those missing values. Uh, so these five are not an exhaustive or formal list. And in fact, there is some significant overlap among some of these categories. But the core idea is that a task category is a generalization of a set of problems. And the reason that this is useful for us is uh, if you are trying to determine, for example, whether or not a given animal is a cat, um, or if you're trying to figure out if this thing that you're about to eat is a hot dog, those problems have some similar characteristics, right? These are both classification type tasks. And the advantage of grouping these together is that you know that you can use the same types of methods to solve problems that fall into the same task category. The specific details of those methods or parameters of the solutions won't, won't be the same for every problem, but the general form of the solution will be the same. And we'll talk more about solutions in a little bit. This is an actual app if, if, if you guys want to try it out. So, um, we, we talked about tasks. Um, and so the next step is we, we want to talk about experience. And so in the simplest supervised machine learning applications, the data that you have uh, for building your model is split into two parts. Uh, you have a training set and a test set. And like their names imply, the training set is used to train the model and the test set is used to test it. Uh, there can I should say there should also be a third set called a validation set, uh, which is used for learning model hyperparameters. But we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And um, we'll focus on the training and test sets for now. So how does the process actually work once you've split your data into these two sets? Uh, during training, the model is constantly evaluated on the training set. So you have your model in its current state and you show it the training data and you ask it, you know, what it thinks the correct answers are based on the training data. And then you can compare that answer against what you know the correct answer to be. And you, typically you uh, apply some kind of error function. Um, this could be as simple as subtraction. It, it could be a little bit more complicated. And this generates a number uh, which is referred to as the training error. And so um, you then make modifications to the model to reduce that error. And you repeat this many times 
And uh, as you show the model more and more information from the training set, and you keep correcting it when it gives you wrong answers, uh, then over time, the training error will decrease. When you think that you're done with this step and you're done training, you take your model and you go over to the test set and you evaluate the model. And so this is the same, the, the first half of the process. You show the model, the test input, and you get the test output, and then you compare it against what you know the right answer is. And this, is, uh, this gives you what's called test error or sometimes called generalization error. And this is a measure of how well the model performs on new data. And so this is how well it's expected to work um, if you, you know, take the model out of the lab or wherever you developed it and you want to use it in an application. So there are two goals here um, and they are competing in a little bit. Um, so when it comes to training, you want to minimize the training error. This is a measure of essentially how much your model has learned from the training set. You want it ideally to learn a lot um, and to get a small training error. So when you have a big training error, this is called underfitting. Conversely, you also want to minimize the difference between the training error and the generalization error. And this is because you're building a model ostensibly, uh, as we just said, to use on new data. So if you have a small training error, uh, which means your model learned a lot of stuff, but your generalization or test error was really big, that means your model learned a bunch of details that are specific to the training set, but doesn't describe the test set. Uh, and so this model generalizes poorly uh, and, is, and is said to have been overfit to the data. Uh, the concepts of underfitting and overfitting are closely related to the idea of capacity. And so there is a trade-off between overfitting and underfitting. If your model is not complex enough for your problem, you won't be able to achieve a low training error, no matter how much data you show it. And this, that you, you will underfit. Uh, on the other hand, if your model is far more complex than is required for the problem at hand, then you will overfit your training data. Uh, and, and this, this you know, you, you, you failed in the other direction. And so uh, a, a sort of generalization of, of, of what this all means put together um, is the no free lunch theorem, which states that uh, over all possible data generating distributions, every classification algorithm has the same error rate. And so worded differently, um, it means that you can take a low capacity algorithm, for example, uh, let's say linear regression, and you can apply this to every single problem that exists out there, and then calculate an average performance metric. And then you put that to the side and you do the same thing with a high capacity algorithm, like say like a really deep neural network. And uh, you do the same thing, you, you, you train it on every single problem, and you evaluate your results and you average them, and you'll find that the average error rate, believe it or not, over all of those problems should be the same, regardless of what model you use. And so what this means is that it's important to choose an appropriate model when doing machine learning, to keep a an eye on the balance between overfitting and underfitting. Um, so that was that was a lot of stuff, um, and, and so just, just to... Uh, and some somebody type in the chat. <clears throat> oh, right. Um, we there is I, I do have a section on neural nets, um, which we will probably get to. Um, when when is is there is there a time limit on this? Uh, no, I think we can go over. Is that right, Solomon? Uh, yeah, we can go over a little we bit. We have 12 to 2 blocked off okay. for interpreters. Uh, 12 to 1, but uh, oh. I, I, here, I'll, I'll ask the interpreters. No, the interpreters. It is 12 to 1, and I know that I'm hopping off at 1. So that would mean Heather would be alone for an hour. And, and yeah. that is quite, that's, that's quite a lot. So I'm just letting you know. I, I don't it, think we'll be over. It's only until 12.45, and I do have another call at 1. So I need to hop off at 1. Okay, so we have till one, Mike. Okay, all right. Um, <laughs> we, I will, I will try to get to the point where we talk about neural nets. Um, if we don't get there, I will send an email about neural nets. Um,
But what I meant, what I'm, so neural networks are uh, an extremely high capacity, just real quickly, neural networks are an extremely high capacity uh, machine learning model. Um, they're, they're high capacity because they are incredibly descriptive. Um, they are mathematically proven actually to be universal approximators. So what this means is that given any data generating function, you can approximate it using a neural network. So if you have enough data uh, to train it on, you can make, you can create a neural network that does, that had, perfectly maps inputs to outputs. It's a, it's a, you can create a perfect model. Uh, now it doesn't, it might not necessarily be following, it, you know, on the inside, it's, it's technically an approximation if you look at what happens to the numbers as they pass through the model, um, but you, you will get a perfect mapping of inputs to outputs. And so that's what it means to be really, really high capacity. It doesn't matter how complex your problem is. If you have a neural network that's big enough, deep enough, you can, you can, you can, you can learn that function. Um, okay, all right, so we actually don't need to talk about neural nets later. All right, great, okay. So um, practically, um, let's say that there exists some unknown function or distribution uh, defined as f um, that you know, uh, represents a relationship between inputs. Um, so so you, you, x goes in, y's come out. Um, and let's say that you, you don't know what f is, right? Somebody, somebody hands you this function, it's a black box, but you want to know, you want to, you want to learn what f is. And so you can approximate f of x using some machine learning model, which we define here as ML. And you'll see that uh, it, you know, ML accepts the same inputs, which is x, and ideally it produces the same outputs, which are y. And you'll notice an extra letter here, which is theta. And so theta represents the parameters of the machine learning model. Theta are what you change when you are training the model, when you are fine tuning it. And so different models will have different parameters that need to be learned. And so what theta looks like is specific to the type of model that you choose to solve your problem. So for example, um, uh, let's, uh, we're probably mostly familiar with, with what a linear equation looks like. Uh, this takes the form of y equals mx plus b. So m is the slope and b is the intercept. And so in this, in this scenario, if you have a linear regression model like this, you, you, theta is, rep, is m or the, your values for m and b. And so when you run a re linear regression given your data, you are learning what the values for m and b are. And so in this case, theta are, are your parameters. Once you have figured out what m and b are, you now have your entire machine learning function, which maps your inputs x to your outputs y. As a potentially more complicated uh, example, you can have polynomial regression, which is just linear regression to a higher order. And so you can see in this case, the number, the theta, your parameters, uh, you know, increases based on the you know, the order of X that you choose to use for your polynomial regression. And so in this case, you'll notice that this letter H, which represents the order of the equation is not represented in theta. That's because H is what's known as a hyperparameter. These are typically referred to collectively as Lambda. Um, although I guess that detail isn't super important. And, and, and the reason that this is a hyperparameter is because the, the shape of your solution changes significantly based on what H is, right? If H is equal to one, then you have a linear regression problem. But if H is equal to four, then all of a sudden you have a quad power uh, equation and that, 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 that behaves very differently from a linear equation. All right, so um, but we'll, we'll, just, we'll just keep going with, with this example. Uh, imagine that this is your data set that you have to train your model. So, you have uh, inputs and you have a hundred of those and you have a hundred matching outputs. And so you might separate this into a training set and a testing set where 80 of your samples are in the training set and the remaining 20 are in the test set. And the process of training your model, um, as, as we included before, you start you know, with your first input. You feed it into your randomly initialized you know, machine learning model. And it gives you like, here's what I think Y is based on this value of X. And then you compare that value against the actual value of y. And here's your training error. Based on you know, that error, you can update uh, theta uh, based on you know, what direction the error pointed in. And then uh, you go, and this is a loop. So you repeat this with the next training data, uh, data point and all the way until you know, you've used all of your training data. Cycling through all of your training data once is called an epoch. Uh, and in a lot of cases, you will train the, the model for several epochs. 
eventually uh, you're going to think that the model has learned everything you could possibly learn from the training data set. And then you just go over to the test data set. And so here you feed in the last 20 data points that it hasn't seen before. Uh, you get you know, what the model thinks the correct answers are and you compare them against the actual answers. And then here, this is your generalization error. Um, right, okay, so are there, are there any questions about what we just talked about? Okay, great. Um, we're gonna move uh, into the next section, which are just a quick overview um, of uh, some learning algorithms. So uh, the first category of, of problem and, and associated algorithms is, is supervised learning. And so this is probably the most common type of problem. We've already seen a couple of different examples of this. And so, uh, but as another example, let's say your friend is trying to sell his house and his house is 2,500 square feet. And he wants to know, you know, what's a reasonable amount to, 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 to expect to get for this house, uh, ignoring all the other things that matter, such as where it's located or how many bathrooms there are. And so you do some research and you come up with this data uh, and you could try to fit a model to this, right? You could, you could you know, set up like a straight line um, through this data here, or maybe it you know, tapers off a little bit towards the top. And, you know, maybe your friend's house is worth, you know, $400,000. This is a supervised learning problem because we have a data set where the correct answer is, is theoretically available, right? Based on well, every single data, data point here, you have an input, uh, which is the size of the house in feet, and an output, which is how much money the house sold for. And so um, based on this training data set, we can, we can create a model that is able to predict some type of continuous output variable. And so this particular supervised learning problem is also a regression problem. Uh, now, you could imagine um, a different supervised problem where we are trying to define, you know, a tumor as being malignant or benign based on the size. And so once again, we have a training set with correct answers, and we want to build a model that predicts an outcome. Um, uh, the, but the difference between this and the house price prediction problem is that the outcome is not continuous. It's a categorical variable, right? Either the tumor is malignant, yes, or it's not, no. And so this is called a classification problem, where the goal is to classify data samples into one of these two discrete classes. Uh, now you're not limited to just having two classes. You could you could have multiple you know you could have multiple classes if you want. Um, and uh, just a logistic regression is a specialized form of the generalized linear model, which is is typically used for these types of classification problems. Uh, this is where the uh, the for those of you who are more math inclined, the, the typical probability distribution um, it, um, used by linear regression is Gaussian, uh, but logistic regression uses a Bernoulli. Um, so the examples we've seen so far have you know, just one predictor variable, but you're not limited to that. You can have more if you want. Um, so you could imagine instead of just looking at tumor size, you also add in the age of the patient. And you can see that you know, th there are you know, maybe uh, if, um, you have a large tumor and the patient is very old, then the tumor is more likely to be malignant. Whereas if the tumor is smaller and the patient is younger, then the tumor may be more likely to, to not be as bad. And so, uh, you know, you can, you can see that if you just draw like a straight line between these two groups, you get a pretty decent classification. Um, you know, you, you only, you know, maybe get these two wrong. And so this, that, the drawing the line between the groups is essentially what a support vector machine tries to do. Um, it defines the decision boundary, and then it examines individual vectors from data points uh, to sort of nudge the boundary in either direction to uh, generate better predictions. And of course, this is not limited to just two dimensions. You can put you know, many, many more features in it, um, but of course, the visualization of that um, gets very messy. The second major type of learning algorithm is, is unsupervised learning. Uh, this problem is less structure than supervised learning. And actually, the, the, there is no structure in this problem, right? In this problem, we are simply given a data set and we are asked to introduce a structure. So uh, for example, this is a uh, heat map. It's a, it's a visual representation of uh, some gene expression microarray data. And so uh, we have, uh, so imagine basically each column represents an individual and each sort of square in that column represents the gene expression level of one of their proteins. And um, 
you can, you know, you, you can generate this, this visualization and then you can run a clustering algorithm uh, to group these individuals into types of people. And so from this, we might be able to learn associations of genes with different disease phenotypes. So for example, you know, this group of patients, um, they all look very similar. Um, all of their genes are underexpressed. Uh, whereas, you know, this group of patients, um, all of their genes, these, these particular set of genes are overexpressed. And so you could group this as, you know, patient group A, and this might be patient group B. And then once you have that information, you can look at other data that you have that might tell you, okay, besides the actual, you know, difference in their genomes, what does that mean for the patient? Is, are, are, does this group of patients, are they more likely to respond to a certain drug? Um, are, are, does this group of patients, are they more likely to have more severe side effects? Um, those are things that you would want to do with unsupervised learning. The last two types of problems um, are reinforcement learning and semi-supervised learning. We're, uh, these are a bit more specialized, so uh, we don't go into as much detail, but the defining feature of reinforcement learning is a focus on performance. So in this task, the machine is not given necessarily correct uh, input-output pairs, and instead it's simply told whether or not it's succeeding. Um, and so you could imagine training an algorithm to play Flappy Bird um, and it's hard to tell, you know, exactly when to tap the, the phone so that the bird flaps, but you can tell it, you know, after the bird runs into a pipe, uh, hey, that strategy did not work very well. And over time, it can learn how to play the game better. Uh, in semi-supervised learning, uh, which is depicted down here, some of the training data has labels, but some of it does not. And so... Uh, sometimes this is described as a subtype of supervised learning because typically the tasks and uh, the goals are the same. But the lack of correct labels on the training data provides some unique difficulties. Uh, for many problems, you have just a small amount of labeled data available, but a large amount of unlabeled data. And so with a supervised method, you would be limited to using only the correctly labeled data using a semi-supervised technique, you are trying to maybe also learn using the unlabeled data too. And so typically the approaches uh, employed here are a hybrid between what you might see in an unsupervised learning problem and a supervised learning problem. These approaches are uh, common in recommender systems, but they are also particularly powerful in biomedicine. Um, all right, so I hope you guys have enjoy that overview of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, I, I think we do have a couple of minutes um, and, and I can take some questions. Or if we can has questions, watch the computer and learn how to play Flappy Bird. <laughs> I wonder, does everyone know Flappy Bird? I remember you did this several years ago. Is it still a thing? I don't, I'm actually not sure. Uh, I, yeah. don't, I don't know what the, the kids are into these days. Uh, it, um, so, so basically, um, it's exactly what it looks like. The, the bird <laughs> is dumb and doesn't know how to fly properly. And uh, you're trying to get it to not run into the pipes. So basically, every time you tap the screen, it flaps its wings once and it goes up. And if you don't tap the screen, it just falls down. And so you want it to not hit the ground and you also want to navigate it in between the pipes. Does anyone have any questions for Mike? Um, I do. This might be kind of like more for my own benefit just because I'm working on something so it's not quite as much from the presentation but can you like explain the difference between support vector machines and discriminant analysis? Um, so like LDA and QDA, because from what I know, they both do the same thing that you mentioned, like drawing a line in between two features or like multiple features or dimensions, but I don't know how they differ. Um, let's see. All right, so I want to say, it's been a while since I've looked at discriminant analysis. My understanding of how that works is that it uses Fisher's discriminant. It looks at all of the data points relative to the decision boundary. Is that correct? 
Um, the difference between that and support vector machine is that typically a support vector machine only looks at the data points that are closest to the boundary. Um, most implementations of SVM that I'm aware of don't bother, uh, you, you know, like don't bother, um, what's the word? Uh, like expending the computational resources to look at data points that are far away from the boundary because you, they, they don't necessarily have a lot of effect. Um, I think also just uh, typically the representations of discriminant analysis allow for like, I guess weird is not a scientifically correct term, but just more irregular um, separations between groups. Whereas for a support vector machine, theoretically um, it, it defines a, a straight boundary in you know, however many dimensions your data is in. After I don't, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how, like how useful that distinction is. Um, I think, well, okay. So, I mean, I'm just going to ask you about your project. Like what kind of, what are you trying to use these for? Um, I'm using it to determine between emotional states, like calm or distressed using EEG brain data. Okay. That's, how that's really cool. Um, I mean, an argument could be used for trying both of them out. You might not see a significant difference um, between the two methods, um, being that they are both relatively similar. Um, or you might find that one works better than another, and then uh, it'd be interesting to see why. Yeah, my project is basically comparing them. So I'm, I'm like using them, but I had a hard time understanding what they were doing different. So that's really thing. That's really helpful. Thanks. I think, um, let's see, I'm trying to think what helped me. Uh, I think going through the math behind um, like a couple of like training loops, specifically for the SVM, um, helps a lot like intuitively with understanding what it does. Um, my understanding is that the, the, the Fisher's discriminant analysis is not necessarily, like you don't necessarily train that, uh, but I might be wrong. Like I'm, I'm pretty sure you just, run that uh, and it's not, it doesn't technically learn, but I might be wrong. But typically, typically I would, I, I would go back into the math, um, try to find like the seminal paper that the, the method is published in um, and then just sit down with it. Um, I'm sure, I mean, it depends on, I guess, like your, your, your math background, um, but it, it, it's typically pretty elucidating. I'll try that. Thank you. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> well, thanks, Mike. I think we have run out of time. Um, if you can send slides to Solomon or I so we can post sure. those, those would yeah. be good too. Um, but thanks again for, for giving the talk. And thanks, everyone. Um, what is our next Wednesday, Solomon? Is that yeah. our next uh, meeting? Wednesday at noon. Club. So I'll see everyone then. If you need anything before then, send me an email, a text, Discord message, anything. Yep. Bye, everyone. All right, great. Thanks, guys. All right. Well, thanks, Mike. That's great. Yeah, you're welcome. I think I think that went pretty well, uh, given that it's, it's the first time we're doing this online. Yeah, it's uh, it's always interesting to give talks online, but I guess your defense was online, so you have at least yeah. given a talk online before and realize how weird it is to kind of just talk to a machine. Yeah, a little bit. Um, yeah. Well, I had I had the uh, sort of like the chat like grid uh, open like the gallery this time because I I didn't do that for my defense and I I had no clue uh, <laughs> what reception was looking like. So yeah, okay. I will I will send these slides uh, to. Solomon right now. Perfect. And that's it. Thanks, Mike. Really appreciate okay, it. Great. Thank you guys. Have yep. a great day. See you. Thanks. You too.